understanding that the way uh, uh, Star Trek Discovery has set up their mycelium network is, uh, is scientifically flawed, you wrote uh, an interesting article about the use of the fourth dimension would make some of the elements of the mycelium network possibly work. Yeah, so right now we say like, okay, there's like three spatial dimensions and right, we can go, we can go length, we could go, we could go length, width and depth, right? You have your three separate directions, right? You have how long something is, how wide something is and how deep something is. Imagine if you didn't have three dimensions. Imagine if we lived on a flat two dimensional surface, like you live on a sheet of paper right? You can say, oh, I want to get from one side to the other side. And you're like, oh, we'll just go straight across. And I say, no, that's too slow. I don't want to go just across the space because you two-dimensional nincompoops, <laughs> you don't even know that there is a third dimension. And if I took this and I folded it, right? Now I can go from one end to the other just Blip, blip, right? They're actually touching each other. So I can go from here to here like that by folding space. And that's kind of the concept of how instantaneous travel could be possible to a two-dimensional creature if it could access the third dimension and to a three-dimensional creature like us if there exists and we could access a fourth dimension. When? When? <laughs> <laughs> When? Yeah. So, so we could get, we could get impatient, right? And be like, come on, where's my fourth dimension? Where's my instantaneous travel? Because what I really want to do right now is leave my house and go to that socially distant beach that no one else knows about and just go enjoy myself and this lovely way may weather that someone is having somewhere. Um, and you know, this is a really lovely dream and one that you are not alone in saying like, if this is even remotely possible, why aren't we working on this harder and trying to bring it into reality? And, you know, I could beg you for funding to say, yeah, yeah, we should be funding this. But I could also look at this and say, you know, it's important when you're developing something to use your imagination, to be creative and to understand that what we know about physics and the laws of nature today are almost certainly not all there is. There is almost certainly more to learn. And it's very important to keep your mind open to all of the possibilities, no matter how unlikely they seem, that are out there. So when you're imagining the far future, some of these things that you say, okay, well, I can't rule out that it's possible, but I don't know how I'd make it possible. We don't know when those advances are going to come. But we do know for 100% certainty that if we don't imagine those possibilities and we don't start exploring them, they'll absolutely never come to fruition. Dr. Siegel, do all of these models and ideas start out as math? Not necessarily. Math is one way to get there. Math is like the tool, right? And it's an incredibly useful and powerful tool, but it's not always the only tool capable of doing the job. So when you say, can it be described by math? The answer is almost always yes. I don't know of an instance where something we've observed can't fundamentally be described by math, but mathematical endeavors and explorations aren't the only thing that lead to these new imaginings. Sometimes they come just out of left field or just from someone's someone's brain going on something or from a phenomena that we saw that we can't explain or from captain kirk captain kirk is his <laughs> own unique thing if you can fight god and win there's no mathematics behind that that i know of so captain kirk you know he he has his own special case that um whatever laws of physics he's on i want them <laughs> <laughs>